OK. Um, so two lectures to go. Um, I'm, today I'm going to pick up some, some themes from sort of yesterday's talk about monoidal categories and monoidal functors. Uh, but it's sort of going to be a talk in, t in two parts. And the first part is going to be a bit, almost a, a laundry list of just different types of functors um, and different sort of ways they can preserve structure or have different domains and codomains. Uh, and this is mostly uh, that you'll, you'll see these words over and over in, in Haskell libraries and also in, um, in category theory in general. And so I thought it might be good as we sort of begin to wrap up just to sort of expose you to a lot of different words. So it's going to be a bit of a laundry list, a lot of concepts, uh, but hopefully I'll be able to sort of construct a reasonable path through them that gives you some sense of what they are and that you can sort of get familiar with them all later. Um, the path goes through these different types of functors and eventually ends up at the UNA dilemma, which is sort of the second part, and it's sort of a distinct topic. Uh, but it, now that we have sort of this, this language of functors available to us, we can start making more precise uh, these ideas about sort of shapes and, and categories being defined by relationships, or objects and categories being defined by their relationship to other objects. And so just um, partly as sort of a cultural experience, I think it's good to to sort of end the course by, by talking a bit about this. But also, uh, there's the UNA dilemma is really, it's, it's called a lemma, but it's sort of a very powerful theorem. And it's at the core of a lot of category theory uh, and is useful in, in programming. So we'll see how this sort of, the type of reasoning involved in the UNA dilemma and some variants of it are, are useful for certain programming constructions tomorrow and in Bartosz's talk. OK, so to the actual content. So we ended yesterday uh, by, actually, I thought it might be good just to, if I'm defining lots of classes of functors, to, to remind you, or to put a definition of the functor class on the board. I um, hope this is all familiar, but the point is that if we're given a type constructor f, uh, we can sort of, this is a thing that takes some objects, some types, and, and returns a new type. And we can sort of lift this to the notion of a functor by providing this uh, instantiation of f map, which says if I have a, an arrow of Haskell function from a to b, then I should be able to get a function from f a to f b. Um, so this captures this sort of categorical notion of a functor. Right? Um, and in particular, it's really, we, th we think of this not sort of completely generally as a functor, but as a functor from Hask to Hask. So there's this sort of pretend category Hask, and this sort of uh, an in instance of this, this type class is thought of as an endofunctor on this thing Hask. Right. Um, so yesterday we saw the, the idea of sort of a monoidal structure. So recall monoidal categories. Right. Um, and we had this idea, one example we spoke a bit about yesterday was set with uh, the terminal object as the, the monoidal unit and the product as the Cartesian, uh, as the monoidal product. Right. And so we have this sort of analogy with Hask. Uh, Hask also has a terminal object in some sense and this, this monoidal, uh, sorry, this categorical product. Um, and they're written sort of unit or this empty tuple and this uh, pair tuple. And so we're and when we sort of try and import these notions and structure our programs using them, we, we pretend that this is the structure available to us, that Hask is a sort of a monoidal category in this way. Right. Um, so then in this world, we have this uh, functor class where we can extend the functor class to talk about those functors that are monoidal, that preserve the, the monoidal structure in the relevant way. So there's a type class used in Haskell, which uh, says that given something of type class functor, I'm defining a subclass monoidal uh, where we supply sort of two extra methods, which are given the names unit, um, which is a map from the monoidal unit to f of the monoidal unit, and this sort of double asterisk thing. Uh, it's an infix notation, and the parentheses make it sort of an outfix notation. Right? And what's the type signature? Well, it sort of it's meant to take sort of well, let me let me write some comments, right? 
Uh, the type signature for lax monoidal functor we saw yesterday sort of looked like this. We had sort of f of a. It sort of mediates the tensor product on the, the domain and the, between the domain and the codomain. So this is the tensor product on the codomain, um, and there's a tensor product on the domain. Um, we use the same symbol, somewhat confusingly, but we want this relationship between them to say that our, our functor is preserving or respecting the structure in some way. And so there's this natural map between them. And of course, we don't talk about all the laws and the naturality in Haskell, but we do want the type signature. Uh, so we have to convert this, we curry it. Uh, so this is the product in, in Haskell. And we have a map from f of a. First argument is f an f of a. Second argument is f of b. And it returns an f of a, b, comma b, because our tensor product is the pair. Right. So this is, this is a class available to us in in Haskell. Um, in fact, so, so what kind of question does this, uh, does this class answer? Well, one question you might have is, with this f map, if with this class functor and f map here, uh, it says that given a function of one variable, I can lift it to some, some function uh, also of one variable, but uh, between the, the images of the type under the functor or the, the type, type constructor. Right. But Sort of, you might ask how to lift functions of two variables. And so one answer is provided by this monoidal categorical structure. Right? So if I have, I'm really looking for something, uh, a method or a function of this thing, of uh, the type that sort of takes a function of two variables. This is curried and returns a function of two variables, but where we have f in front of all our, our types. Right. Um, so how, how do we th sort of think about constructing this, fun this sort of function using this lax monoidal structure, or using an instance of this type class? Well, we can sort of uncurry it, right? And we can consider this as a pair of the, the input as a function from the pair a, b to c. And then if we apply sort of uh, f to it, we apply f map, um, we get this function from f a comma b to f of c. Um, and now we want to precompose, so, but we want the map from f of a to f of b to f of c, right? But we can precompose with this map here, right? So if I do sort of, uh, let's see, I want to do this one first, so I'm going to sort of do. This is the way the notation works, right? You put the first thing in, in the inside. Right, OK. So you put the first thing in the inside. So then we have a map from f a to f b. And then it went to f c. And then we composed with this thing here. Um, and so the result is, sorry, I think I said that wrong. I have this map, goes from, takes an f a and f b and returns an f of a comma b. Uh, but this map takes the f of a comma b and returns the f of c. So by composing them, I get this map, which is sort of the lifted thing that I wanted. Um, so that's one way of thinking about how to lift functions of two variables. And this sort of monoidal structure gives us that. It's not actually the structure favored in Haskell. So the structure favored in Haskell, Haskell is this language that really likes the curried form of functions when we're thinking about functions of multiple, multiple variables. So instead of uh, privileging this sort of thing, which this sort of monoidal structure, structure which privileges the, the product or this, this pair constructor, uh, we, we might do this some other way. So say given a function from A to B to C, instead of, carrying it, uh, instead of uncurrying it, I want to consider it as a function like this. So I have an F of this type. Um, let me write it like this. Right. What can I do? Well, if I apply f map to this, I have f map f, and the type signature of this um, is f a to f of b to c. Right? So another way I could end up with a function of this type, which is where I want to end up, uh, is if I have available to me a function that <coughs> takes something of this type, f b to c, and returns this thing that I want, right? Which is an FB to FC. So 
So there is a type class that sort of captures this notion, and that's called applicative, right? So the, um, the, the definition of this type class is sort of class, again, it's a subclass of functors, uh, and it's called applicative. And the definition asks for, um, it actually asks for two things. One is this sort of map called pure, which I'm sort of kind of gloss over, but it's sort of the, the equivalent of this unit up there, uh, up to some transformations. But then it has this operator, which is exactly of this type. And I'm just going to do some sort of name substitution back to A to B. Right? So it takes an F from A to B and returns a map from FA to FB. OK, so let me tell you just a couple fun facts about these applicatives. Um, One fun fact, and by this I mean if you have some spare time or if you get bored, it's a, it's a fun thing to do to try and sort of explain why this is true. Um, but in Haskell, sort of every monoidal functor, by that I mean instance of that type class over there, is an applicative. and vice versa. So I said that there was this problem of just lifting functions of two variables. And I presented two solutions um, that look, in some sense, quite distinct. Um, they're sort of related by this sort of currying adjunction. One sort of works on, on the function type side, and one works on the product type side. Um, but it turns out the solutions are equivalent. So by this statement, I mean that if you have these two, two methods available to us, then you can construct functions of these types. And vice versa, if you, have this, if you have an instance of this type class, you can construct an instance of that type class. And in fact, I say in Haskell because I just want to be more precise about this. But if you're sort of more mathematically or categorically inclined, you can sort of remember that monoidal functors want just sort of the definitions of these things. These maps had to be natural, and these maps uh, had to obey these sort of unit and associativity coherence conditions. Uh, so it's also the case that uh, applicatives really, when studied from a mathematical perspective, should also have some laws associated with them. And it, this statement can be turned into a sort of more mathematical statement. If you, have this, if you want to construct this notion of a, of a monoidal closed category, then you find that lax monoidal functors are equivalent to these things called lax closed functors, which are the notion of an applicative. Um, so you could sort of spend some time trying to figure out what all that means and proving that fact. OK. Um, another useful fact to know um, is that in Haskell, and again, this is sort of code for in lax closed categories, sorry, monoidal closed categories, every monad is an applicative. In fact, uh, this fact is, is sort of important enough that sort of originally the monad type class was sort of a standalone type class. But now, um, if you look at the definition that's currently in Prelude, um, you'll, you see that we, the monad sort of type class definition begins class. We start with an applicative and make a subclass of applicative. Um, so class applicative monad f where and dot 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 right. So we require our monads to explicitly be applicatives, um, and this is useful because often when you're working with a monad, you actually want to grab this structure and and work with it. Partly because you want to solve problems of this type where you want to lift variables of two arguments. Okay, so that sort of ties this stuff of monoidal categories uh, back to this sort of notions of monads. I also wanted to point out that 
sort of these, these two sorts of functa are about taking the notion of functa and saying we have extra structure lying around in our category and we want our functa to preserve that structure. So there's the monoidal structure, but there's also this word closed, right, which sort of is related to this having these, these function types. Um, and so if you look at this, what this is doing from a categorical point of view, say, uh, it's a map from, I'm going to write my home objects b to the a, this idea of an exponential object, um, and I have a functor. So the first, the domain of this, this function has this type, and the codomain is looking for maps of this type, from fa to fb. And so we're looking for a way of mediating the, between the exponential in the domain and the exponential in the codomain. Of course, the domain and codomain are the same in Haskell and, and so on, so it sort of blurs this a bit. But um, that's, so, so these functors, these applicatives and these monoidal functors are about sort of preserving structures available to you in the category. OK. Um, next up, I want to introduce the notion of a profunctor, which will um, become useful tomorrow. OK, I'll clear this. Um, it might be nice to point at this definition of functor, but I trust you to remember it. OK, so part two is profunctors. Um, so in, we've already seen this functor class by functor. Um, and what this requires, is, the idea is that this is some sort of the categorical equivalent of having a binary operation, right? So a functor, a monad, uh, sorry, a monoid requires sort of you take two elements of set and you return another element. And this is sort of the categorical equivalent. We have two categories and we sort of have this map where we take two objects and return a new object, right? So the examples we saw are things like pair or this pair type um, or this thing either, which is the, the co-product or the co-pairing type. Right. Um, but what we have is this method available to us by math, which takes, so we have a type constructor of two variables. And given two functions, separate types, we can construct a function from their sort of paired, the, well, I say they're paired types, but that's really leaning on this intuition very heavily. Um, sorry. It's, it's just you, you shove these, these, these domain types through the type constructor and the codomain types through the, the type constructor. Right. Um, so there's another, there's another sort of functor type of two arguments that is, is really important in Haskell called a profunctor. And in fact, it's it's in fact more critically important in mathematics than this idea of sort of a bifunctor too. So to give a mathematical definition first, a profunctor from some category C to some category D, and I'll just put this line through there to sort of slightly keep it separate from the functor notation, uh, is a functor F from so given any category C, we can take its opposite category by sort of reversing the arrows. Um, we can take the product with this other category D. And a profunctor in particular goes to set. Um, although there are some subtleties as we, we sort of move this to Haskell, which I'll mention in a moment. Um, so that's the definition of a profunctor. It's just a special type of functor. Um, but while these sort of talk about binary operations, um, these sort of generalize the notion of a binary relation, which uh, we've sort of skirted around a bit, but David mentioned in particular as this sort of Kleisley maps for this, this power set functor. Uh, so he gave the example of the binary relation between sort of uh, people and dogs called sort of people owns dogs. And regardless of what you think about the politics of that, <laughs> uh, the idea is you take a person, a dog, and you return a Boolean which says yes or no according to the ownership status. Right? This generalization um, allows us to not only talk about uh, individual sort of yes or no things are related, but the set of ways things are related and requires them to sort of 
the functoriality condition, the compatibility of the maps, requires them to sort of uh, cohere nicely with how we sort of change up our types. Um, okay, so that's the definition of profunctor. Uh, what does the profunctor class look like? Uh, actually, I'm going to put it over there so I can sort of juxtapose things a bit better. So, the profunctor type class. Um, So class, sorry for this, profunctor f where, and now we want this particular method dimap instead of bimap, um, which looks a lot like bimap in that it takes, yeah, it takes a function from a to b and a function from c to d, um, but instead of returning a function from fac to f BD, we have this what's known as contravariance in this second in this first variable. So it's going to return a function from F B C to F A D, right? So this A and B are swapped from the definition of bifunctor. Um, okay. So it seems like a simple variant on, on bifunctor, but it's it's quite useful um, and. The main example you should be thinking about is, is just this notion of the, the HOM profunctor. So given any category C, um, so given category C, there is a profunctor sort of C blank blank, which goes from C op times C to set. OK. How does this work? Well, given two objects, I need a set, right? So if I have a pair, uh, say, AB, what set should I get? Any thoughts? What's well, a simple set I can get out of two objects in a category? The set of A and B. Right. Uh, the set of A and B? Like the set. Containing those two ah. That is a set. <laughs> um, that's not the one I was going for. Uh, is that containing the word pair A different I was going for the hum set. Uh, but thanks for your contribution. It's a good, <laughs> good try. Uh, <laughs> um, that's a very reasonable contribution, actually. And I think, I wonder if we can turn that into a profunctor. Let's talk about that afterwards. It's an interesting question. Um, I don't know whether we can turn your construction to a profunctor. I know we can turn this construction to a profunctor. Um, and, and this profunctor is really interesting because it starts to encode the sort of entire of the structure of the category because it says that given some objects, I get out all the morphisms, right? So you might be asking, how is this a, a profunctor? How is this a functor from C, C op times C to set, right? So we need to specify not only the action of objects, but the action of morphisms, yes? I'm wondering, I had this question, why, why is it opposite category? Why, why not just like use C? That's a good question. Um, let's see what we're, we're going to do on morphisms. So let's say I have um, a morphism from A prime to A. That might be surprising notation. Um, and a morphism from B to B prime. So this, I'm writing morphisms in C. But really, this F here is a morphism from A to A prime in, in C op. Right? Um, but there's a very natural action of a pair of morphisms like that in C on the HOM sets. Um, so my profunctor should, well, now it's just a functor. Um, my functor here should specify an object, uh, sorry, a, a function, right? So a morphism in set. Given a morphism in the domain, I want to specify a morphism in the codomain um, from C A B to C A prime B prime. Right. And so the question is, uh, how do we take some morphism phi in this set, right? So this is a morphism phi from A to B, and turn it into a morphism from A prime to B prime. Because right. that's what a function from here to here does. And so the answer is I have to use what I'm given, right? So I want a morphism from A prime, and it's going to end up at B prime. And I know I can get from A to B using phi. But I need to get from A to A prime to A and B to B prime. 
And luckily, I gave myself that data, right? I've got an f that goes from a to a prime, oh, sorry, a prime to a, and a g that goes from b to b prime. And so I can construct this function from morphisms from a to b to morphisms from a prime to b prime. So to your question, uh, why should it, this be contravariant in this factor? Well, it's because if I gave myself a morphism from a to a, a, to a prime, then this sort of construction wouldn't work. Um, and that's it's sort of a, a fundamental fact, which we'll sort of see a bit more of throughout this lecture, that uh, this sort of, in some sense, precomposition, what, what, what goes on here is that we're trying to describe the structure of this category. So we pull out the morphisms. This function should also describe the composition structure. And sort of, we might think of there being, as being pre-composition and post-composition. And pre-composition is contravariant, and post-composition is, is covariant, which is, so I'm using contravariant and covariant for uh, sort of the difference between whether a functor keeps the direction of the arrows the same or not. Um, I'll write that a bit more explicitly in just a second. How's that? Mm -hmm. to, to right. Really That's a great intuition. Uh, so there's a sense that sort of a binary relation acts as a bridge. Uh, it talks about the relationships between two different sets. Um, but it's a very simple sort of bridge, because it, it sort of just answers, can we get from person to dog, or something like that. Whereas this adds a lot more of complexity, uh, a lot more complexity according to the structures that are available to us in the language of categories. So it says that there's a whole set of ways to talk about getting from A to B. Um, and yeah, it's, it's an excellent intuition that can really be explored in, in a bunch of different ways. Question? Uh, uh, in the Haskell version, mm -hmm. you get a function from A to B, but it doesn't necessarily need to be invertible. How do you use it to construct the time? Ah. Yeah, so the question was, there's a function from A to B in this sort of, in the Haskell type, but doesn't need to be invertible. Um, so we never actually inverted the, the functions we were given here. Um, what we did was, in fact, require that we were given a function in the opposite direction to begin with. So in some sense, we, re we required having this inverse-like thing, if that's the, the perspective you want to take. Um, in other words, this is going from A prime to A, not a to a prime. Um, OK, so the examples you'll see in Haskell, I mean, this is an important example. But we sort of introduced the notion of monads so we could talk about Claisley categories, which are sort of categories that are not sort of the, the base thing that you start on with the monads, so are not set or not Hask, but have built in, but are based on this category and build in some extra structure. And so you might see, so the monads, so the profunctors that you'll see um, and not only this sort of home profunctor for the category Hask, as it were, um, but for these sort of Claisley categories that you can build on top of Hask. And that's, that's sort of the structure you, you can often work with. Um, OK, so, so Bartosz will pick that up a bit more tomorrow, um, this idea of a, a profunctor. I want to now talk about. Um, this sort of contravariance a bit more, just sort of to focus on the first variable here. So a very important notion in category theory leading to the UNA dilemma is the notion of a pre-sheaf. Right? So to give you yet another definition of a type of functor um, that I've sort of been implicitly using for the past 10 minutes anyway. A contravariant functor, C to D, is a functor C op to D. Um, and it's sort of confusing. Uh, the conventions have sort of fallen in, in a strange way. Uh, Sometimes for the word that would be, sometimes people put these on a more even footing, this notion of contravariant functor versus this notion of functor. Um, and if they do that, then they, they describe a normal functor as covariant rather than contravariant. But the, the difference is this sort of flip, right? And co means that you a covariant functor takes an arrow from A to B and returns an arrow from FA to FB. 
uh, whereas a contravariant functor takes an arrow from A to B and flips the direction and returns an arrow from FB to FA. So let's write that explicitly as a type class. Uh, here's another type class you might see, class contravariant F, where this has a thing called contramap, and it does what I said. Uh, it takes a function from A to B and returns a function from FB to FA. Ah, okay. Like an example of that. Okay. Like like owners and dogs Um It's a good question. What would be enlightening? Um so for owners and dogs, right, uh, they're not categories. They sort of live within so you we would want C to be like the category of sets, and there's a home for a functor for the category of sets. Um so a discrete category? What would that be? OK, let me try that. Here's a, uh, is a discrete category that interesting? I don't know whether it's enlightening. Let's try this category. Let's try a very simple small category, though, like this category, the arrow. right? Um, so here's a category. It's going to be C in this example. So the profunctor says that given uh, any two objects, I get the set of objects, so the set of arrows from the first to the second. right? So. Um, Let's also draw the identity arrows explicitly. Uh, so, and I'll call these things 1 and 2. So for example, C12 is equal to this arrow, which is just going to be called, uh, let's call it smiley face. It's going to be called the set smiley face. Right? Whereas C11 is going to be called the set identity on 1, which is this arrow. Um, so in fact, this is really just the notation we've been implicitly using all along, but now we've given you a sort of structure, a sort of type of structure that this notation is reflecting. Um, like this notation is saying a category is sort of like a functor of two arguments, but it's really a profunctor. Um, but then I guess your question is, what is the action, what is the, the F map here doing for us? So what this is saying is if we have a morphism from, um, so if I pick a morphism that ends up at 1, so here's a morphism that goes from 1 to 1, and I guess I pick a morphism, OK, this is a bit too trivial. Um, <coughs> but uh, yeah, it's a bit too trivial to see what's going on. If I, but. What I can do is pick a morphism from 1 to 1 and a morphism from 2 to 2, and then I get a function from C12 to C12. Um, and that's given by sort of taking this morphism smiley face and doing sort of, so this morphism is called C of identity 1, identity 2, since those are the two morphisms that I picked. And what it's saying is I take smiley face in here, and I sort of pre-compose with that and post-compose with that, and then I get a new morphism. But Unfortunately, I picked a very trivial example. So I don't think that's very enlightening, and I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> but let me, I'm going to talk a bit about contravariant functors in a particular on functor. And what we'll see is sort of talking about this in one argument. And so it might become a bit clearer as we go on. A question over there? Uh, so this uh, definition of pro-functor in Haskell is really a functor from Haskell times Haskell. Hat. Has. Yes. So it's really a Haskell It's It's, that's a very good point. Mm -hmm. um, so, sorry. Can you repeat the question? Yes. So the question is, uh, what what is? How do we think of the type of this thing if we were trying to translate it into category theory and sort of explore that analogy? Well, this thing, um, if we allow ourselves to have, well, Hask as a category, and there's something else I wanted to say, but I forgot it. So. What it takes is two objects of Hask, two types, and returns an uh, object of Hask. So it has this form, which doesn't really look like this. Like we, can sub we can say, OK, I'll take C, or C and D equal to Hask, but this, I put a, a sort of specific category in here, and I want to turn this category from set to Hask. Should be Hask off there. Uh, yes, it should be Hask off. Thanks. Um, so what is going on? Um, 
this notion of profunctor, so there's a notion, you might notice that in, in categories, I want to, we, we define things in a way that these HOM things were sets. But in Haskell, the HOM things are not really sets. If I want to talk about sort of the set, the, the morphisms from A to B, they're the type A arrow B, right? And this is a type. This is an object of Haskell and not a set. Um, so there's this notion of, it's sort of related to this notion of closure, which we sort of skirted around at the, uh, at the beginning of this lecture. But there's an, also a notion of enrichment that says, given sort of, we, we have these things, HOM sets in the notion of a category, but we can generalize to a notion of HOM object where the object is taken from another category. And so this, this comes sort of hand in hand with the notion of an enriched category. And so we say that the categories we've been talking about are enriched in the category of sets, but really the proper way to think about Haskell uh, slightly more precisely is to think of it as self-enriched, so enriched in the Haskell category itself. Um, and so when you're talking about profunctors in a more general enriched setting, this, this domain, should, so this codomain should be the, the category of enrichment. Uh, so when we talk about this thing where I'm really sort of sweeping a lot under the rug, or I'm really talking about a Hask profunctor in the setting, which is a, a functor from the Hask enriched category Hask op times Hask to the sort of enrichment Hask, right? Um, well, we can explore that more. Um, in the notes or after class. That's a very interesting point. OK, so back to this notion of a contravariant functor. Um, so to simplify this notion of this sort of hum profunctor, we can also talk about uh, a specific sort of contravariant functor called a presheaf, and then talk about these things called representable presheaves. So I'm throwing a lot of definitions at, I, at you, I know. Uh, I don't expect you to remember them all, but hopefully they start to sound familiar over time, and you sort of can place them in sort of the landscape of category theory. So a presheaf on a category C is a functor. Um, so it's a contravariant functor to set from C, or in other words, it's just a functor from C op to set. Uh, and so I guess to anticipate the same question that was just asked, uh, in Haskell, this is sort of a, a notion that varies with enrichment. So you might want to think of this as Hask if you're in the Haskell world rather than set. Um, so um, there's sort of, let me give the example up here. Uh, so an example of a presheaf is just to take this example of the, the hum profunctor and put in something in the covariant variable. So given um, an object A in some category C, we get a presheaf Y of A, which you might also call hum blank X, sort of hum blank A or C blank A, um, which is a functor from C op to set that, what, and so what does it do? It takes an object x and tells me all the arrows from x to a. And it takes a morphism from y to x. So this is a morphism in C, it's, but contravariantly viewing it in C op. Um, and it tells me what happens if I pre-compose with that morphism. So now I get a function from C x a, so arrows from x to a to arrows from y to a, which says that if I have some arrow from x to a called phi, then I can get an arrow from y to a precisely by sort of going from y to x via f, and then x to a via phi. Okay. So this sort of, when we talked about this notion of sort of objects as shapes in the category and them, having, them probing other objects or viewing other objects. This sort of wraps up that notion into a neat package. Now we have a language to really say a bit more precisely what we meant by that. Right? So we have an object A, and I can say, well, given another object a shape X, um, we use C before, sort of what are all the different ways that X can see A? Right? And this is the HOM set. Uh, so the collection of these things is 
what the functor is returning. The functor says, given an object, I get a set. And so given the shape x, I get the set of sort of x-shaped elements, generalized elements of A. Right. And then there's also this way that sort of x-shaped generalized elements that we can sort of have this relationship between the shape x and the shape y. And that, given sort of an x-shaped view of, of A, this, this relationship can turn it, say, how do we turn that into a y-shaped view of, of A? Right? And that's what this, this function is doing. It's saying, there's, I had this particular view of A from x, but then I had this sort of view of x from y. And so that translates into this composite view. So here's f, here's, sorry, I did that wrong. Here's f, here's phi, and here is f then phi. Right? And so this, that, that whole analogy of, of shapes and generalized elements, elements packages up nicely into this notion of this, this functor. Um, and so we call this functor uh, the representable uh, pre-sheaf on A. Right, so for every object A in a category C, we get a, a pre-sheaf that is represented by A. And so it's, it's a representable pre-sheaf. Okay. So let me move that down here, actually. Now I'm going to move across back to here. And now we can, we can talk about this Yoneda lemma. So the Yoneda lemma is, in some sense, this coherence result that applies to all of category theory. And so what, what do I mean by a coherence result? I mean that in, if, if you've noticed as we define categorical structures, what we do is we sort of say, uh, let's look at the definition of a category itself. We have all these types, sort of A, B, and we have these things F, uh, these morphisms, and we have this composition rule that says, given th some, some data, sometimes I can compose them. Sometimes I can return back this sort of map. F then G, right? Um, but then, as we as we have this world to play with, we get sort of these ambiguities, right? I draw these three arrows in a row, and you you say, well, is this thing? Am I referring to F then G, then, sorry, that's F then G then H, or am I referring to F then G then H? And we have these sort of axioms that say, that we enforce, that say, you can't have that ambiguity. Those two things are the same. Um, so the Yoneda lemma um, isn't enforced as an axiom, but it kind of falls out from just the sort of natural coherence of category theory. So with that introduction, let me tell you about what it actually says. So um, theorem, Yoneda. So we start with, uh, we're given an object A in C, and then a pre-sheaf on C. So I'm going to call that F from C up to set. And so we're given two bits of data, and we've got various ways in our language, which is now quite rich. We've got all these functors and stuff. And oh, I need to tell you one more thing. Um, sorry. A quick comment. There's a category of pre-sheaves. So there exists a category called pre-sheaves on C, where the objects are pre-sheaves. So these are functors C op to set. Uh, and the morphisms, well, if I have two functors from C op to set, right? so f and g, there's a, a notional morphism that's already given to us, which is a natural transformation. So that's a, that's a category. It's a specific sort of functor category, which we've talked about a little bit. Anyway, OK, back to the UNA dilemma. We're given two bits of data. We're given an object of C, and we're given a pre-sheaf on C. So how can we construct, 
how do we construct sort of in our language sort of things from an object of a category and a functor from that category? Any guesses? Any comments? Apply the functor, did you say? Yeah. yeah. So one way we can get a set is apply the functor f to the object a. And now we get a set. There's another thing that we can do, though. Um, and it's a bit more subtle, but the clue is that I, I told you that this category exists and that I told you representable functors exist. So instead of sort of taking this and applying it to this, I can promote this object of C to the world that this lives in. right? So I can get this representable. Um, and I've said that the representable is called y of a for a. And so this is another pre-sheaf. And so now I have two objects of a category. I have a, a pre-sheaf y a and I have a pre-sheaf f. And so I can talk about the HOM set, the set of morphisms, which is the set of natural transformations between them. And the Uinator lemma says this, these things are isomorphic, and moreover, that they're sort of isomorphic naturally, whatever that means, in A and F. Um, what that means is that you can sort of construct a world where this is a natural isomorphism in the sense of natural transformation. Uh, but I won't sort of, I don't think it's enlightening right now to fully construct that world for you. Um, okay. So this looks very abstract. Let me give you an intuition for why it's surprising or why it's important. Um, and the surprising thing is, let's think about what a, pre what a morphism from YA to F is. Right? So it's a natural transformation, which means that for every object x in C, I need to have a map alpha x from y sub a of x to f of x. And moreover, that for every, uh, it's contravariant, so for every morphism from um, y to x, I should have a morphism sort of y sub, well, I want these diagrams to commute. So y alpha y, f y, and we can apply f to f, and we, we get this community square. This seems like a lot of data. It means that for every x and for every element of this set y sub a of x, for every morphism from C a to x, I need to specify an element of the set f of x. On the other hand, on this side, we just had the set f of a. right? So I just need to specify one element of one of these sets. Um, so it's easy to see how we could go and take a, a natural transformation and construct just one element. I mean, by easy in the sort of categorical sense of easy, which involves staring at it for a few hours, maybe. Uh, but what you can do is there's this object you have available to you called A in your category. Um, and then we have this function called, from, called alpha sub A from y of A A to f of A. So we've got a way of accessing things of this type. Um, but we also have a special element called the identity on A, which is a morphism from A to A. And so this maps to some element called alpha a of identity of a. And that's an element of f of a. So that's a way of taking a pre-sheaf and getting an element. What's interesting is that this is a bijection. So that no, every possible morphism between pre-sheaves gives a distinct element of, a, uh, of f of a. And that's all the, all the morphisms of pre-sheaves that exist. Right? Um, and so just for, for time reasons, it'd be interesting to discuss, well, it'd be interesting to discuss how to go back the other way, but for time reasons, I'm going to sort of maybe leave it to Bartosz tomorrow or to an exercise to sort of for you to figure out uh, how sort of this one element here happens to contain all the information in this entire natural transformation over there. Um, but that's a very powerful fact you can use about reasoning about programming, because it says that this compresses a lot of information. Or in other words, that maps between pre-sheaves are entirely structured, and we understand how they're sort of so rigidly structured. Um, I want to close just by noting sort of a couple of corollaries. Uh, the first is that you can take f equals to be a representable pre-sheaf itself, right? So what happens if I 
take f to be y of b, then what it's saying is that pre-sheaves, morphisms of pre-sheaves between these two representative pre-sheaves, y a, y b, are the same as sort of the, the ways that a views b, right? So this is the set of morphisms from a to b. So we find out, in fact, that there is a functor from C to pre sheaves on C um, that sends a, an object of C to its representable pre sheaf. And that pre, this functor sort of is, is what's called um, full and faithful. The homs between the images are just the homs between over here. So it somehow takes this category C and sort of faithfully uh, represents it, includes it inside the category of pre sheaves. Um, so one corollary of that is that if sort of Ya is isomorphic to Yb, so if we have two isomorphic representable pre-sheaves, then A is isomorphic to B. So this says that if we have two objects that appear the same, so going back to this analogy here, where the pre-sheaf is des describing how, all, how this object A view, is viewed from all the other objects in C, we see that if A and B are viewed in the same way, or in isomorphic ways, by all other objects of the category, then those two objects have to be the same up to isomorphism, which is this notion of sameness that we care about. Right. Um, so to sort of operationalize this and to quickly close, there's a nice game you can think of here, which is the Yonei dilemma, which says something like this. If I pick an object of a category C, so, so we agree on a category C. There are two players. There's you and me. Um, if I pick an object, sort of A in C, and I keep it secret, but I could tell you Y of A. So that means that if you tell me an, another object, I can tell you the. If I, you tell me an object X, I tell you all the X-shaped generalized elements of A. If you tell me a morphism, I tell you how that morphism sort of changes one from one view to another. Um, then your job, your goal, is to sort of guess the object A up to isomorphism. Because I haven't told you A, I've just told you sort of how A looks from, all the other, from, from the point of view of every other object in the category. And so what the Yonei dilemma is saying, um, and this is on the problem set, is that you can always win this game. Um, no matter what object I pick, you can extract that object up to isomorphism out of me describing the representable pre-shift to you. Uh, so if you have time, I'm going to close the lecture now, but maybe pick a friend, um, <laughs> write, pick a category that you like, set or a finite category or something like that, and you can, you can play this game. And you can notice that someone's rigged in someone's favor. Uh -oh. Thanks.